ago, on a bright Saturday afternoon, I visited a good friend of mine in the hospital. Colin had just had a stroke, and we talked a little bit about brains because that was something Colin was really interested in. He was fascinated in how the brain worked, and even though something really terrible was happening to his brain that day, he was still curious, and he still wanted to think about it. Now, after a while, Colin needed to be sedated, so he couldn't tell us whether things were getting better or worse for him, but the MRI images that we could see told a very clear and sad story. What we could see was that more and more of Colin's brain was being progressively destroyed. And this was going on and on for days until finally, the following Friday night, with his favorite music playing in the background, the machines were turned off and Colin left us. Now, watching someone's brain being slowly taken from them is a nightmare, and it's a nightmare that I know a lot of people in this room have probably been through because it's not just strokes. It's all sorts of common things, like common traumatic brain injuries can have an immediate initial injury and then days and days of continual damage. And right now, there's absolutely nothing we can do to specifically target and block that progression. I'm a neuroscientist, and that's frustrating. So what do I do about it? I study brain tsunamis. Now, I'm originally from Australia, so my accent can be a bit tricky to follow, but I did say tsunamis. And that's the colloquial term we use for monster waves of brain activation that we now know are a key for brain injury. So if we start with something a little more familiar, if you imagine an, a tsunami in the ocean, that starts when something really dramatic happens, like an earthquake. The earthquake spreads its energy into the water, the water makes a big wave, encompassing everything in its path, until finally, when it hits a beach even a thousand miles away, the impact can be tremendous. Well, a tsunami in the brain can be similar in many ways. For the example of a stroke, it could be a small clot that works its way up to the top of your brain and immediately causes damage to just a small patch of brain. And that's a bit like the epicenter of an earthquake. That triggers a tsunami that then spreads out across the brain and the earthquake keeps going. So the tsunamis keep going day after day, weakening the brain, wearing down its defenses, and causing this progression of injury. For over 60 years, as brain tsunamis have been the stuff of legend to a small group of believers, but for most scientists, and probably almost all clinicians around the world, they were considered with a lot of skepticism and even ridicule. And that was reasonable because even though tsunamis have been recorded a lot in the laboratory from animals, there had never once been a recording from one from a human. And that's weird, because there had been thousands of studies where people had put electrodes on the top of people's heads, and never had one of these be things been seen. So they were strange and perhaps not real. Well, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons they were missed is that the machines that are usually used to measure brain activity focus usually on the very fast, normal brain activity. And the electrodes and amplifiers are actually designed to exclude, to block out big, slow events. Because those big events didn't fit assumptions of how the brain worked. They were considered to be nonsense. The other big reason they were missed is that it's actually quite difficult to record tsunamis through the thick human skull. Instead, you really need to be under the skull, on the squishy surface of the brain itself. So that's a little bit like, for an ocean tsunami, putting buoys right on the surface of the water itself. If you have a string of buoys across the surface of the ocean, you can tell a lot about where a tsunami is going, which direction, how fast it's going, and how big it is. And that's much the same with the brain tsunami. If you can put a strip of electrodes 
right on the surface of the brain. Now, here's the problem. I can't go to you and say, excuse me, would you mind if I opened up your skull for a little bit, had a look inside and just checked it out for tsunamis? What do you think? That's absolutely something you could not and should not ever ask a student volunteer to consent to. But, <laughs> but fortunately for this story, there are a small number of folks around the world who do have a piece of skull surgically removed for brain injury treatment to relieve pressure. And that gives the opportunity to put in a strip of electrodes and look for these events. An international consortium called COSBID was formed to make these measurements. And these investigators from around the world shared their data. And the results are nothing short of breathtaking. Tsunamis are real in humans. They occur with tremendously high frequency following brain injury. And just like what was predicted in the lab, they do cause the progression of brain injury in humans. Now, at this point, some of you might say, Bill, you're being a bit biased because you're telling us you're very confident about tsunamis and brain injury, but that's the only place you can see them right now because it's the only place you can look in. What about in uninjured brain? Are there tsunamis elsewhere in the brain? Well, let me ask you this. Who in the audience has ever had a migraine? That's quite a lot. About average, that's a lot of people. How many have had a migraine with a visual aura? Wow, OK, that's a big number. So for those of you who haven't had this, this is not pleasant, but this is a, um, a shimmering or sparkling that can slowly progress across your field of vision, maybe taking about 20 minutes. That shimmering is almost certainly caused by a brain tsunami. It's caused by something happening strong at the back of your brain and the tsunami spreading over your visual cortex. So rest assured, that is absolutely not going to cause any injury, because the brain can recover really well from a single tsunami. No problem. But you would agree it's a pretty dramatic experience. And so it raises the question, are there other conditions where other strong stimuli might generate a tsunami in a completely different part of the brain and change your behaviors or even your moods, even in a way that might be good and make you feel better. We just, we just don't know. We, we don't know whether they're always bad. And we don't know where else they might be, because we don't yet have good ways of looking through the skull in healthy individuals and other conditions. But it seems worth checking. Now, to me, this is a great example of how much there still is to discover about how the brain works. If things as big as tsunamis can be hiding in plain sight for 60 years, what else, what other strange and spectacular things are going on in all of our brains that we're currently completely unaware of? But let's go back to the beginning. While it's fun to speculate about how the brain works and all, and believe me, I do love to do that. Let's go back to the beginning. So my friend Colin in the, in the hospital room and others like him currently don't have anything that can be treated with that slow progression. We think this idea of tsunamis is a game changer. Now we can monitor these events and do something about them. We and others around the world have been working very hard to understand everything we can about tsunamis, to try and understand their vulnerabilities. How can we get at them? How can we disrupt them or prevent the bad things they do to the brain? We're developing medicines that seem to be effective, and they're in, in, in testing right now, but it will be a few years before they come into clinical use. But we're pushing hard because we are very optimistic that soon a doctor will be able to say to a family, there's something we can do to keep the damage limited in the brain to just the epicenter of the earthquake, so that the consequence in the body may be just a droop at the side of the face. And if we can stop tsunamis damaging more brain, maybe we can stop the consequences spreading throughout the body. And that scenario to us is tremendously exciting. It's tremendously surprising, and it's wonderfully hopeful for all of us in this room, and for everyone, everyone around us that we love and care about.